What do you see when you look at this photograph? Somalian soldiers? A winter scene? A woman in a leopard skin coat? If you didn't know this was a lesson on Jewish resistance during the Holocaust, would you believe this might be a production still from a Bob Hope, Bing Crosby Road movie from the 1950s? Or a fashion shoot for a fur company? In reality, this is a picture of four Jewish resistance fighters, or partisans, taken in 1943 in Poland by Faye Schulman. This photograph, and many other resources we'll be sharing with you, helps break stereotypes of Jewish passivity during the Holocaust, and will prepare you to answer the number one questions students ask when studying the subject. Why didn't the Jews fight back? The answer to the question is, of course, the Jews did fight back. Approximately 30,000 Jews, many of them teens like your students, fought back as Jewish partisans, and millions more opposed the Nazis and their collaborators through nonviolent resistance. My name is Mitch Braff, founder of JPEF, the Jewish Partisan Educational Foundation. I have personally interviewed over 50 partisans, developed curricula with a talented team, made many films about the partisans, and taught thousands of educators about this important subject. To date, JPEF materials have helped inspire over 1 million students and transform perceptions of the Jewish experience during the Holocaust. You can visit www.jewishpartisans.org for more information. Workshop Goals Our goal is to give you the tools and information to teach one or more classes on Jewish armed and unarmed resistance using the JPEF Educator Toolkit and our extensive online resources. The toolkit contains a DVD of JPEF curricula and short documentary films, plus links to the JPEF website, including online video courses and a quick start guide to help you start teaching about the Jewish partisans in minutes. JPEF was started 15 years ago to ensure that the stories of the Jewish partisans will be taught to future generations. We started by conducting 50 original interviews with surviving partisans and using these primary sources to make innovative curricula through a variety of lenses, from history, ethics, and leadership, to over 8,500 educators. So let's look at the first film JPEF produced, Introduction to the Jewish Partisans, which runs about six minutes and is comprised of interviews with Jewish partisans. These are the images that come to mind when people think about the Jewish experience during the Holocaust. But these are not the only images. There were 20 to 30,000 Jews who formed organized armed resistance groups all throughout Europe. These little-known freedom fighters conducted thousands of acts of sabotage against their Nazi oppressors. They were known as Jewish partisans. People did not go only like sheep to their death. People were fighting every which way they can. I did my job the best I could. I was in many battles with the Germans face to face. Sometimes maybe a hundred foot away. And uh, bullets were flying all the sides. And luckily, I survived. Let's say a German column was marching to, uh, through us. We ambushed them. The partisans, they fought for freedom, for a better tomorrow, for a better future. And they fought fought in order not to be eliminated by the Germans, against the Germans. Jewish partisans were responsible for the liberation of thousands of Jews trapped in ghettos, saving them from annihilation. I started to organize an escape. I had 55 people that they were willing to escape. From the 55, 30 were killed. 25 made it into the woods. Without the forest, we couldn't survive. The trees, the sky, the pine needle ground were our summer home. The underground hut was our winter home. We're dealing with friendly 
an unfriendly peasant. The friendly peasant supported us with food and with ammunition. The unfriendly peasant had no choice. We would get in at night, pick up the prepared food orders that were prepared for the Germans, and leave receipts. The partisans were here. The moon was our biggest enemy, because if there was a moon night, because in day we couldn't go, in the night. If there was a moonlight night, we couldn't move. So the night, the blizzard, heavy snow, heavy rain, this was our, this was our friends. Jewish partisans committed thousands of acts of sabotage, significantly impeding the Nazi war effort. We were interested in getting involved in sabotage acts to interrupt and disrupt the communication and transportation to the front. We attacked the depot. We hit the guard and got ammunition, and we blew up the train depot. We could see the Germans there, and I could recognize the Germans that I wanted to kill, who killed my friend. And, and they started to shoot, to, uh, shoot towards us, but when they shot, they shot all only with, from revolvers. They were not prepared, they didn't have rifles, they didn't have machine guns. We overpowered them, so little by little their shooting stopped. We had to blow up a train, and um, it was sitting in the background and waiting till the train approached, and some of the Germans got killed. It's the same to Jews as it is to Americans to, to study the Revolutionary War and its heroes, right? People put their chest in front of, of English muskets to build a country. We put our chest in front of German muskets to, to defend ourselves from annihilation and maybe prevent the death of other Jews. If I was going to get killed, I was going to get killed as a fighter. Not because I'm a Jew. I survived for two legacies, for revenge and for telling the story. Revenge from my father in telling the story from my mother. So if I had a chance, and if I looked for, a re for, for resistance, this was the most important thing for me. And I didn't care if I would be killed, if I wouldn't be killed, I had to do it. There's such a thing as fighting back. This is the way I think. That's why I'm sitting here to give, give you the interview. Why else would I do it? I want the people to know that we were fighting. This is the hymn of Jewish partisans. So we came on us to gaze them let's and they came let I in a pastel and blow it take. Come and wait the hunts are always giving the show. Sweat a point in the broad me rain and do. Come and wait the hunts are always giving the show. Sweat a point in the broad me rain and do. Sprotzen wet out unser gwore unser mood. Gesingen mit na ganes in die hen. This film is part of the JPEF Educator Toolkit, so you have access to this yourself. It's also available on our website, which we'll look at momentarily. Think about the questions your students might ask after seeing this film. Here are four of the most common ones we hear, which I'll answer after a brief history of the Jewish partisans and their historical context. First, let's review the definition of a partisan from the film. A partisan is a member of an organized body of fighters who attack or harass an enemy, especially behind enemy lines, a guerrilla. There are approximately 30,000 Jewish partisans in about 10 European countries. What did the Jewish partisans do? They saved thousands of lives. They also sabotaged the Germans and their collaborators. This was part of a much larger resistance movement, well known in Eastern Europe, but little known in the United States. By some counts, there were nearly one million non-Jewish partisans throughout Europe. It's important to contextualize this material within the history of the Holocaust and World War II in order for your students to understand the unique challenges and ethical dilemmas Jewish partisans faced on a daily basis. For instance, your students have to know what anti-Semitism is 
and that it did not just appear with the rise of Hitler in Germany. It's important to teach that Jews were treated as second-class citizens for hundreds of years in Europe. Pop Quiz What treaty was signed August 24, 1939? Call out the answer if you think you know it. I hope someone said the German-Soviet Non-Aggression Pact, also known as the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. This divided Poland roughly in half, giving the western part of Poland to Germany and the eastern half to the Soviet Union. Poland, in essence, disappeared and was absorbed into these two countries. This is when the Holocaust starts in Eastern Europe and also the beginning of many partisan groups, organized armed resistance on the Eastern Front. This is an actual pre-World War II cartoon with the caption, Wonder how long the honeymoon will last. In 1941, when the Germans broke the non-aggression pact, hundreds of thousands of Red Army soldiers were killed in the German Blitzkrieg. Hundreds of thousands more were put in concentration camps. And hundreds of thousands ran away, dropped their weapons and uniforms so they would not be identified as soldiers, and escaped into the forest and swamps. They did not escape to form resistance groups. They escaped literally just to live another day. Eventually, they regrouped and started planning to fight back as partisans, as they were no longer connected with Moscow and the Red Army. These were the seeds of the partisan groups in Eastern Europe. Like the soldiers, the majority of Jews who escaped the camps and ghettos did so to survive, not to start a resistance group. Once they were out, a few managed to find their way to the partisans. A small number started all Jewish groups. Others escaped to unarmed family camps, a few of which acquired weapons for self-defense. There are also instances of Jewish youth groups that organized in the ghettos, then smuggled themselves out to form partisan groups, such as Abba Kovner's Avengers in Lithuania. But even for Jews who escaped intending to join the partisans, finding them and getting in were nearly impossible tasks. A question that comes up often is, why was armed resistance so rare? I think a better way to look at armed resistance is presented by Dr. Michael Berenbaum, who counters that, given the near insurmountable obstacles, it's surprising how much resistance there was in the first place. Perhaps you're familiar with the analogy of the frog in boiling water. So for those of you who are not, if you had the diabolical thought of wanting to boil a live frog and you threw the frog into a pot of boiling water, the frog will actually jump out. Why? Because the frog feels the tremendous heat of the water, is strong, and though painful, can still jump out. But if you wanted to successfully kill the frog, you would put the frog in the pot at room temperature and then turn the burner on. By the time the water reaches the boiling point, little by little, the frog has been successfully acclimated. When it finally realizes the danger, it's now too weak to escape. This is how we teach about the Jewish experience during the Holocaust that happened to many. The Germans did not announce their plans to murder every Jew in Europe. If they did, there would have been a lot more armed resistance. You remember the sign above Auschwitz? Albert Mark Frey? Work will set you free. Over a million Jews were murdered at Auschwitz-Birkenau, many of whom believed they were simply in a work camp, so there was nothing to be afraid of, no reason to resist, right up to the moment they were killed. Besides, why would the Germans kill their slave labor force? It made no sense. Secrecy and propaganda, lack of information and communication, all made it difficult to take that step to resist in the first place. Remember, this was in the days before Twitter, before widespread telephones and radio in many places, so no one really knew what was happening, and the Jews were used to being treated as second-class citizens. Sure, things looked bad with the Nazis, but the Jews survived the Crusades, the Inquisition, and the pogroms. They survived this. There are many other reasons, including the Nazi policy of collective responsibility. When you teach about the partisans and resistance, it's very important to understand why it was so hard to physically resist, because the punishment for even taking food often was death. So why would someone even try to risk escape? when your entire family could be murdered as a consequence. It's crucial to teach about the partisans in the context of other types of resistance. Guerrilla warfare was just the tip of the iceberg. The myth of sheep to the slaughter is just that, a myth. There were literally millions of acts of Jewish resistance during the Holocaust, from documentation in underground newspapers reporting Jewish life in the ghettos, to hiding in attics and sharing crust of bread, to sabotage enslaved labor camps and factories. There was artistic resistance. 
There is spiritual resistance, as this photo from the Lodge ghetto pictures so beautifully. As historian Martin Gilbert wrote, even passivity was a form of resistance. To die with dignity was a form of resistance. To resist the demoralizing, brutalizing force of evil, merely to give witness of these events in testimony was, in the end, a contribution to victory. Simply to survive was a victory of the human spirit. Partisans relied on hit-and-run tactics rather than conventional tactics as their small numbers and limited weapons were no match for the Germans. They emerged from the forests and swamps to derail supply trains, ambush enemy soldiers and collaborators, bomb strategic sites, and collect vital intelligence for the Allies. Some students ask, what is the difference between a partisan and a terrorist? The short answer is that the partisans sought out military targets and their operatives, taking pains not to harm civilians though that sometimes happened by accident. Terrorists often target civilians. For a more in-depth discussion and critical thinking questions on this topic, take a look at JPEF's Tactics of Resistance lesson on the Educator Toolkit DVD and on the JPEF website. Many of your students will ask, what did the partisans accomplish? There are only about 30,000 of them. That isn't very many. What could they actually do? The partisans were crucial to thwarting the Nazi war machine forcing the Germans to use precious resources in territories they already occupied and divert troops they would have otherwise have used in the invasion of the Soviet Union. One German commander called Jewish partisans a dangerous element and was worried about their effect on the overall German war effort and perhaps on German morale. It's hard to quantify what Jewish partisans accomplished because few records were kept. We do know from historian Dove Levin that approximately 10% of the 22,000 Lithuanian partisans were Jewish, yet they were responsible for the majority of enemy train attacks and a disproportionate number of enemy casualties. Why? The simple answer is that they were highly motivated. Most Lithuanian partisans were fighting to free their country and could go home between actions, melting into the populace. But Jewish partisans had no home to go back to. Their friends, their families, their entire communities were wiped out, and they faced an enemy bent on murdering every last one of their people. You heard Norman Salzitz say in the film, I survived for two legacies, revenge for my father and telling the story for my mother. Jewish partisans fought so hard because they had nothing else to lose. Still, what were 30,000 versus the millions murdered, tortured, and exiled? Consider the story of Anne Frank, we all know her story of resistance, hiding, keeping hope alive, and documenting the experience in her diary in incredible detail. That's just one person, yet she inspired millions of people worldwide. So the numbers are not the point. The point is that the Holocaust is not complete without teaching about resistance and the Jewish partisans. The number of partisans during World War II was huge. Hundreds of thousands of allied guerrillas throughout Eastern and Western Europe mostly in the Soviet Union. The vast majority were non-Jewish, and there was frequent anti-Semitism. Jews in non-Jewish groups were discriminated simply because they were Jewish. The truism, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, was not true if you were a Jewish partisan in Eastern Europe. Many Jewish partisans were killed by non-Jewish partisans and anti-Semitic locals. All Jewish groups had clear advantages to Jews, the most famous of which were the Belsky partisans, but these were few and far between. On the JPF website and your Educator's Toolkit DVD, you'll find a study guide and accompanying short film narrated by Larry King on anti-Semitism and the Partisans that runs about 13 minutes. The film was put together from original interviews with former Jewish Partisans, sharing first-hand accounts of their experiences. Less than 10% of all Partisans were women. They served as soldiers, spies, medics, vital support personnel, and fighters. Their numbers ran significantly higher in many all-Jewish groups. We have a lot of resources on women partisans, including a study guide and short documentary film narrated by Tova Felchu, both on your DVD, and a short video course on our e-learning site, which I'll tell you about later. These are great resources for Women's Study, Women's History Month, and inspiring your students with true stories of women who overcame traditional gender barriers to stand up and make a difference. Now that we went over some of the basics, let's go back to the introduction to the Jewish Partisans film and answer some of the most common questions. Where did the footage come from? 
There was not a lot of embedded photographers or camera operators in World War II as we have embedded journalists in war zones today. Most of the footage came from film archives or newsreels from the Soviet Union, Lithuania, and Italy, which was made for news and propaganda purposes. We, of course, don't know which of the people in the film were Jewish partisans and which were non-Jewish partisans, but the incredible footage is representative of resistance activity. Where were the Jewish partisans active? Jewish partisans were active in at least 10 European countries. The majority of Jewish partisans were in Poland and the USSR. On the JPEF website, you can look at interactive maps and meet partisans from different countries as well. A lot of students want to know, how did the partisans get weapons? Three main ways, as spoils of armed combat, occasional airdrops, and from the weapon caches made from the retreating Red Army soldiers. As I mentioned before, when the Germans invaded, hundreds of thousands of Red Army troops were killed or captured. Hundreds of thousands more got rid of their uniforms and dropped their weapons to avoid being recognized as soldiers and fled into the vast forests and swamps of Eastern Europe. This resulted in arsenals of abandoned weapons and ammunition throughout the area. Local farmers found the weapons and ammunition and stashed them for themselves. They didn't readily hand their caches to fugitive Jews, but many partisans got their weapons this way. Airdrops were rare and only happened later in the war and, to my knowledge, not made directly to all Jewish partisan groups, but Jewish partisans sometimes received some of the weapons. There are five different partisans who are in the film. All in all, there are 50 Jewish partisans featured on the JPF website with interviews, primary documents and photographs, and short biographies. One of the most interesting aspects about the site is ultimately how everything is driven from these primary sources, from the partisans themselves. The film, the curricula, the website are all built on their testimony. I'm now going to show you an example of how you can learn more about specific partisans from the website. This is the JewishPartisans.org website. Roll over the Explore tab and pick JPEF Partisans. You'll find a list of the 50 Jewish partisans we interviewed. You'll also find a couple of sentences of biographical information and a thumbnail image for each to help you decide who to learn more about. Do you remember Sonia Orbuck from the film who said, if I was going to get killed, I wanted to get killed as a fighter? Let's take a look at her profile. Here you can open up a window with a short biography about her, including a map of where she was active in the partisans. If you click on the words in yellow, you'll open up a glossary window, which you can also print out. Click on the video tab to watch a few curated clips we have from her four-hour interview. Here's a great one to discuss with your students that discusses some of the challenges women had to face in the partisans, speaking to the commander's wife. And I was called in, to actually, uh, to the commander's wife. And uh, she talked to me. I was a youngster, sheltered, did not go out, didn't have any boyfriends or anything of the sort, and she started talking to me. And uh, she said to me, you're a young girl. There are very few women in the partisans. And I would advise you to select uh, an officer. Life will go better for you. And uh, this is my advice. And you listen to my advice. I opened my eyes wide. I didn't know what she was talking about. And I couldn't understand what she wanted of me. And we just let it go. That's it. So imagine the shock, right? For a young woman, a 16-year-old, joining these partisans. These are important points you can discuss with your own students. We also have images in the image gallery for each partisan. After each interview, we brought a scanner and made copies of the original documents and photographs from each of the 50 partisans. Here are the images that we have from Sonia including this one of Eleanor Roosevelt, who came to Sonia's displaced persons camp after the war. But here's my favorite. It's a love note from a young Russian Jewish soldier who caught her eye. Sonia didn't look for an officer, as she was advised to in the clip. What I love about reading this letter is that Sonia, in her 70s when she gave this interview, still has the love note from when she was 16, which includes this line your students can identify with. It was too bad your mother had to intervene. This is a great way for you to engage your students and help them connect with the human side of the story. I got here by simply clicking on the thumbnail image, and then clicking on the print icon to get this view. I encourage you to explore the profiles when you have some more time. 
I also want to show you how to access the drop-down menu of all the partisans and how easy it is to navigate here. You can also print the short biographies by clicking on the icon at the bottom here and access the transcripts from the selected clips here. One way educators use these biographies are through a jigsaw exercise, where each student is given a printout of a partisan biography, then introduces their partisan to their classmates while learning about the others at the same time. What made Jewish partisans different from other Jews during the Holocaust? It's a rhetorical question, I warn you. I'm setting you up. Any thoughts? Jewish partisans weren't braver or smarter or more heroic than other Jews. They were luckier. They also had opportunities that other people didn't have, and they had knowledge about what was happening, that the water was truly boiling, and they had to get out of there right away. Other people didn't have that knowledge, so they didn't escape, and ultimately couldn't even find a partisan group who might take them in. This is very important to teach, so your students don't come away with the impression that partisans were somehow more courageous or braver than the millions of other Jews who were not as lucky as them. Here's an example. Gertrude Boyarski survived the war because of luck, opportunity, and knowledge. Her father had a job that ultimately saved her life in the town of Derecz in Poland. When she first told me of this, I thought her father must be an important person, such as a doctor or engineer. It turns out the Boyarski family was allowed to live outside the ghetto and not go through the onerous security process to enter and leave it because he was a painter. He painted buildings, signs, and equipment for the Germans. They lived in a house that was also lucky for them because it was right behind the local police station. One evening after work, her father was in the back porch and overheard a conversation at the police station where he learned that all the Jews in Direction would be murdered that evening. They now had knowledge that no one else had, and since they lived outside the ghetto, they had an opportunity to escape, which they did. Still, that was not enough to save all her family. Gertrude was the only survivor. For more information about Gertrude, please read the short biography or download the study guide about her incredible story on the JPEF website. There is a great deal of content on the JPEF website. As you have seen, JPEF has produced 50 interviews with surviving partisans with curated clips, short biographies, photographs, and original documents you can explore with your students. We also have interactive maps, a section on the famous Belsky brothers, 20 printed guides and lessons, 10 online courses, and many more resources for you to explore. There are 10 interactive maps where you can meet partisans from 10 different countries and see exactly where they were active. Someone Like Me is a unique way for your students to engage with the 50 partisans on the site. Here you can actually see which of the partisans were picky eaters and which had strict parents. It's a great way for you to get your students to explore and engage with people who were interviewed in their 70s and 80s that at first glance might not have anything in common with them, but then on further investigation, they have more in common than they first thought. We have a tremendous amount of teaching material around the film Defiance, starring Daniel Craig and Liev Schreiber, about the Belsky brothers who saved 1,200 Jews in the forest. JPEF was a consultant on the film, and we have a 32-page study guide that looks at the partisans through the lenses of history, ethics, leadership, and Jewish values. We also have an online video course. On the website, you can access 20 lessons and study guides, including anti-Semitism in the partisans, women in the partisans, ethics of war, a Jewish resistance slideshow, and guides for Jewish schools as well. You'll find eight of these on the DVD. All our materials are available for free online. You can take free online video courses by going to jewishpartisans.org slash elearning. Take Resistance Basics for a more extensive introduction to the partisans or up to nine other courses. These classes are between 25 and 60 minutes in length and you can get free CEUs online for successfully completing the courses. We also created a streamlined version of the Resistance Basics course for your students. It's a half hour long video geared specifically for classroom use. Think of it as a master teacher sharing important facts with your students. When the interviews were complete, we wanted to find out from the partisans, what do you want to teach the next generation? Not just facts and figures, but what do you want them to learn? Here's what they said. Ultimately, JPEF exists not to teach, but to inspire. These are the lessons we want to get across. 
that your students can stand up and make a difference, no matter the circumstance. Also to remember that many of the partisans were teens themselves. To sum up, these are the six basics to get across when teaching about the Jewish partisans. Time and time again, we found that these materials have a profound effect on students, transforming perceptions of the Jewish experience during the Holocaust and strengthening confidence in young people's abilities to make a difference. If all you do is show the six-minute film and take a few minutes to discuss it with your students, you'll be teaching them a great deal. But we hope you'll do more and take advantage of the resources on the DVD and online. Thank you for helping teach the history of the Jewish partisans and for bringing their life lessons to your students. For any questions about this presentation, please email outreach at jewishpartisans.org. Also, please learn more about the Partisans and keep up to date with any new developments on JPEF's Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube pages. You can also download a PowerPoint version of this presentation at www.jewishpartisans.org presentation.